In this lecture, I'm going to give an overview of some of our official Catholic teachings on interpreting the Bible. And I have books thicker than this with church teachings about the Bible from about the 3rd century to the 20th century. So I'm going to be selective here. The ones we're going to look at, uh, 1943, Pope Pius XII, Divino Aflante Spiritu. 1964, the Pontifical Biblical Commission Statement, Instruction Concerning the Holy Historical Truth of the Gospels. In 65, Vatican II, De Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation. In 1994, the Pontifical Biblical Commission Statement, The Interpretation of the Bible in the Church. And 2001, that's also a PBC statement, The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures in the Christian Bible. By the way, the PBC is the Pontifical Biblical Commission, and it currently consists of 24 scholars, 12 New Testament, 12 Old Testament scholars who personally advise the Pope on scriptural matters. And my Jewish friend and colleague, Amy Jo Levine, she gave the keynote one year at the Catholic Biblical Association. She's a member. During the question and answer, something came up. And she said, well, if any of you have any connections, I want a seat on the PBC. And <laughs> Tell them they don't have any women and they won't have to worry about me wanting to be a priest. <laughs> so Divino Aflante Spiritu, the main point of Pius XII was that literary forms have to be taken into account. You have to take into account the genre, the art form that you're reading. This was a big change in Catholic policy. In the, the 20s and 30s, people had asked the Pope, can we take the literary genre into account? Should we do that? No, no, no. Just read it as oracles from God. What else was going on in 1943? It was in the middle of World War II. At that time, he instructed... Uh, Catholic scholars to start taking this into account. And this is really where the reform of the biblical movement begins in, in the Catholic Church. My favorite example of an art form, some missionaries from Switzerland in the jungles of Africa, they wanted to show the natives there how beautiful their homeland was, and they managed to get a generator and a 16 millimeter projector on some sheets that were serving as a, a screen, and showing these beautiful views of the Alps. And the natives were just astonished that the Europeans could make mountains move like that. The mountains were moving across the screen. Now, we know when mountains move across a movie screen, that represents what you would see if you stood on the top and did this with your head. We know that it's the camera that's moving when the, the mountains go across the screen. But not understanding the art form, they thought that the mountains were moving. What could be more clear? So the, the point for biblical studies is when we're looking at material from another culture a long time ago and a, far, far away, often our initial impression can be wrong. Often our initial impression is right. You know, human nature, pretty much the same now as it was then. But often our initial impression is wrong. And so that's why we need to approach the scriptures with a certain amount of humility. The statement on the historical truth of the Gospels in 1965 was that there are three stages uh, in the Gospel tradition. And I like to use the analogy of those old biology books that had the overlay on the page. So you like have the human body and you pull aside the skin and now you see the organs and then you pull aside the, that and, and you see the, the skeleton. Well... Stage one, the words and deeds of Jesus. Stage two, the preaching and teaching of the early church, during which time they told some symbolic stories about Jesus. And also stage three, the writing of the evangelist. He preserves earlier tradition, but also he tells stories about Jesus, some of which 
are historical, others of which are symbolic. So when we're looking at a particular passage in the Gospels, we're actually looking at three different layers of tradition. Now, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, so we can be confident that that's true. But it would be overly simplistic to think that every word in red was actually said by Jesus back in stage one. Some of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the resurrected Christ after the resurrection. Now, for a lot of things, it doesn't make a lot of difference. But if, for instance, you're trying to know how much did Jesus know and when did he know it, then you can't say, well, here in the gospel he said this, so he must have known it before he went to Jerusalem. Because that might come from stage two or stage three. And uh, what is it? Raymond Brown talking about the infancy narratives in his foreword to, uh, it's a wonderful booklet, An Adult Christ at Christmas. Anyone who's going to preach or teach in Advent would do well to, to look at those comments on the uh, infancy narratives. Anyway, he says, many Catholics become upset when they're told that certain parts of the scriptures are not historical. And he refers to this 1965 teaching of the Pontifical Biblical Commission. This has been official church teaching for over 60 years. And yet, how many people become nervous when they hear Jesus didn't really say the Father and I are one before he was crucified? That comes from decades of meditation on the mystery of the post-resurrectional Jesus. And yes, it's true. The Father and Jesus are one, but that's not something he said before he died on the cross. So that's the 1964 PBC statement. Then the 1965 Dei Verbum has our Catholic teaching on biblical inerrancy. That is our teaching about the Bible not having errors. When I was a seminarian at St. Meinrad, there was a semester elective. And we spent an entire semester on biblical inspiration and inerrancy in the Roman Catholic tradition. So we could study this for a long time. But here it says, Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. Now there's two key points, and I highlighted one of them. Let me get the other. For the sake of our salvation. Last year I was out in Arizona at the Faith and Astronomy Workshop put on by the Vatican astronomers. And they were fond of saying the Bible is not a science textbook. It's, it's not an archaeology textbook. So it's the truths that God wanted put there for the sake of our salvation. So whether the sky is really a solid dome and it's blue because there's a lot of water above it, which is the picture in Genesis, that's not for the sake of our salvation. So there can be scientific errors in, in the Bible. And the other thing is, in that first line, since everything asserted by the inspired authors must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, the key word is asserted. If I say, the sun came up at 6.45 this morning, someone might say, you liar! The sun doesn't come up, the earth rotates. Okay, I'm not making an assertion about whether the, the earth rotates or whether the sun moves. I'm just using a common form of expression. And this was the main point of Pope Pius XII's thing about taking forms of expression and literary genres into account. So simply because the Bible says something 
doesn't mean that the biblical author is asserting it. Sometimes it's just using a common form of expression. You, you made the world firm not to be moved. Poor Galileo got in trouble with that. I hope we learned our lesson uh, from him. But some people are still having trouble with Galileo. Anyway, then the interpretation of the Bible in the church. It's an overview of the different methods of interpreting the scriptures. And it gives pride of place to what's called the historical critical method. And the main goal of the historical critical method is to try to find out what did it mean when the ink was wet? What was the original meaning that the original author wanted to convey to the original audience? What was that meaning? I personally was taught in the historical critical school and a lot of people think that I'm a dinosaur because nowadays, well, there's so much historical uncertainty that a lot of people just want to say, well, we can't know if anything happened. And so they want to, to go strictly with treating it as literature, entering the, the literary world. There's a, a certain amount of truth there, but the primacy of place is given to the historical critical method. And then it talks about other methods like the allegorical exegesis of the fathers. It talks about liberationist interpretations, feminist interpretations, all other kinds of stuff that, that's going on. It encourages these other interpreters to be in dialogue with the historical critical meaning of the Bible because if you don't care what the original author was trying to say, then any text can mean anything. I even tell my students, and if they submit something, my first job is to try to understand what you have written, what you meant. And your first job is to try to understand what I'm saying. Now, I, I might be wrong, I might be confused, I might be not saying it the best possible way, but that's our job is to try to understand each other. The fact that sometimes it's difficult, sometimes people misunderstand each other, that doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means we have to work hard at it. And my doctor father, Fitzmeyer, Fitzmeyer was on the PBC when uh, this was published in 1994. Some of my students think that, that Fitzmeyer is uh, a wild-eyed liberal. And I said, you, you don't get to be one of the 24 scholars who personally advises the Pope by being a loose cannon. <laughs> uh, the last one, the Jewish people and their sacred scriptures in the Christian Bible came out in 2001. Here the church officially renounces all form of anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism as contrary to Catholic teaching. Catholic teaching does not hold all Jews everywhere responsible for the guilt of the Jewish leaders who condemned Jesus thousands of years ago. And Amy Jo Levine gave a talk over at the University of Dallas four or five years ago. And during the question and answer, I decided I was going to give her one that she could knock out of the park. So I just kind of lobbed it up there. I know she had written, and she had had some critical words to say about some imperfections in the document. So I said, well, AJ, what do you, what do you think about this? And I was surprised at how gracious she was in spite of her previous criticisms in scholarly journals. She said, I think it's a wonderful document. And she said, there's no pope of the Jews. So it's our job to go around to every synagogue and shul and Jewish university and make known this newer attitude on the part of Catholic Christians. And she said, I would say the ball is in our court, that this was a major step forward. So it, it has been well received by Jewish scholars and it's worth reading, but even if you don't have time to read it, if you hear of interpretations that inspire hatred toward Jews, you can be sure that that has been officially rejected by the Catholic Church in, in this document here.